students don't like me saying this, but I'm not a big fan of tuition freezes or abolition of tuition. If you get the benefit of education, we have to contribute. And then we have to make sure that we have student grants as opposed to student loans, repayment schedules, interest rates levels that don't burden students with huge amounts of debt. Because I want you to start your life, not keep postponing your life to, to get that monkey off your back. So that's the first thing. But we have to make a national commitment to invest in education, and not just post-secondary, but as I said, from early learning and childhood right through the, the cycle of life. And as we face fiscal constraints, this is, gets to your question, the one thing this country must not cut is investment in research and education. You've got to stand on this, because that's where they're going to come, and that's the wrong choice to make, because it sacrifices our future for the sake of our present. As I said when I, when I was defining this new world we're in, the, first, the very first thing I said is carbon's going to have a price. It could be a carbon tax, and it could be a cap and trade system. We think a cap and trade system is the way to go, but it's absolute caps. And we've got to start setting up. A 1990 baseline is the baseline on which we calculate, and we've got to get reductions by 2050 that absolutely guarantee the global temperature doesn't rise above two degrees. And we've got a government, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a hyper-partisan meeting, but let's be clear, this is a government that over four years has done absolutely nothing on this file. And it's worse than that. They've decided for the first two years when George Bush was in office, they were saying we can't do anything because George Bush is in office. Now they're saying we can't do anything because we're waiting for Barack Obama. You won't find a more pro-American guy than me because I, you know, I educated there and blah, blah, blah. But this is Canada. And climate change policy should be set and defined by Canadians. This is a matter of sovereignty. And this is something that's not been said. Of course, if you're going to have a cap-and-trade system, if you're going to have tough environmental standards in Canada, the federal government needs to step up and regulate emissions of <coughs> tar sands, regulate water use in the tar sands, incentivize technologies to get rid of those settling ponds. We've got to do that. And we've got to do that aware that we're in a continental economy. We get all that. But that doesn't mean you have to wait for Washington to find Canadian climate change policy, and that's our position. Our position as a party is we don't need to wait. Let's get going now. Uh, and, uh, and then we figure out how we do it. But the, 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 the international scientific consensus about keeping climate increases below two degrees centigrade is the baseline, the scientific baseline, which should drive all uh, federal policy. Every single meeting that I've attended this week there's been someone from Engineers Without Borders. So you guys must be doing something. <laughs> and I hope you guys are in Haiti because they sure need engineers. That's what they desperately need right now. On the question of corporate social responsibility, as you may or may not know, one of members of my caucus, Liberal member John McKay, has put forward a bill uh, advocating uh, a federal mechanism to require Canadian companies to report on their human rights performance overseas. There's some problems with the bill, it's a private member's bill, but I'm proud that our caucus has taken a lead here. We have mining companies, just to take that example, around the world. We have them in Congo, we have them in Colombia, we have them in Peru, we have them all over the world. It's absolutely essential to our honor as a country, our reputation as human rights defenders, that we have good corporate citizens. And my party is willing to look at any legislative mechanism that will demand that they be accountable. Corporate social responsibility is about accountability. I think it's appropriate for our big mining companies, and they're a source of pride to us. I'm in favor of Canadian mining and exploration in other countries. But we don't want to exploit labor. We don't want to beat up union activists and militants. And we want to make sure that the forms of mining that we develop overseas are environmentally and socially sustainable and have a decent return to the communities that they're part of. And McKay's bill is part of that effort. And when we're in government, I think this is a challenge that your generation is giving to us to which we need to respond. Thanks for the question. And just, sorry, so it's a, it's a self-reporting bill? 
Well, you should look at the details. No, it's not, it's not, it's not just self-reporting. The federal government of Canada, the Department of Foreign Affairs overseas has an obligation to check out whether they're doing their job. It's not just self-reporting, it's more muscular. Two things, first of all, the answer to the question is the moratorium that Pierre Trudeau committed to in 1972 has been Liberal Party policy since 1972 and it's going to stay Liberal Party policy. Sure. <laughs> Secondly, uh, in some of the, the environmental policy that we put forward, we've also said that we need to expand, defend and protect sensitive maritime habitats on all of our three oceans. So it's not just a, a moratorium on ta tanker traffic that we support. We think DFO, the Department of Fisheries and o Oceans and the federal uh, authorities should be increasing the uh, amount of protected maritime zones on all three oceans. So we're there. I think legislation I don't think we need to go there. I think what we need to do is maintain a moratorium. These are sensitive maritime areas. Every British Columbian is aware of this coastline, aware how, how, uh, how easily uh, uh, a catastrophic oil spill here would just devastate the marine environment. And we all have a historical memory of the Exxon Valdez up in Alaska, and that, I think, shaped the consciousness of British Columbia and Canadians for, for several generations. And so, um, a moratorium seems like good public policy and maintaining it indefinitely into the future. But don't you feel that having just a moratorium is leaving it open to, to uh, for example, the party we have in power today who isn't honoring that? It's not really binding. You know? Yes, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> their, uh, their commitment to this is much more uncertain. I can only speak for my party and we're strongly committed to maintain a moratorium. Thank you for the question. These are the kind of question I like to get, um, uh, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to torque the rhetoric up here. But I, I do feel, and I said it in my opening comments, that Canadians are deeply troubled by this Prime Minister's attitude to the basic institutions of our country. Prorogation twice within a year, and the use of prorogation in ways that Canadians think is fundamentally wrong. It's wrong to use prorogation to escape a vote of non-confidence, and it's wrong to use prorogation to escape questioning on issues of fundamental importance to Canadians. There are uses of prorogation that you can defend. It's part of the Prime Minister's set of powers. Prerogative, for example, when you've run your legislative program to an end, Right? And you want to reset and reboot with a new throne speech? That's a legitimate use of prorogation. But the two uses of prorogation made by the Prime Minister are utterly illegitimate. And Canadians have said this to him in a very clear voice. And they've said it to me as a political leader. Right? And then the question is, what do you do about the prorogation power to strengthen democracy? And my view is that you simply have to have political leaders in public life who understand this is our system works by putting limitations on the Prime Minister's power, and that is a good thing, not a bad thing. It has to be in our understandings as democratic politicians. But it doesn't stop there, because every time he's been faced with a regulator that got him into, that was giving his government trouble, he's fired the regulator, Linda Keene, the Nuclear Safety Commission regulator. Uh, he's fired the military, he's not renewed the Military Police Complaints Commission, because they were asking difficult questions about Afghanistan. The RCMP Complaints Commissioner has not been renewed because he was asking difficult questions about the conduct of our national police force. We have to have an understanding in this country that our, the power of a prime minister is and should be limited. That's the bottom line here. And I don't believe that the, this current prime minister accepts that basic understanding of our democracy.